Um, so for the final talk of the evening, we have Spencer Sardesa, uh, the CTO of Output, um, who's joining us tonight to talk about his PhD project, uh, which is um, Oroglyph, uh, Modular Music Sketchpad. So really curious what that's going to be about. Hello, Spencer. How are you doing? Hello. Thank you for the introduction. I'm doing well, thanks. Um, yeah, and thank you, Matt and Josh, for the interesting talk so far, and um, Celine as well for kind of giving us a little bit more detail about the Audio Developer Conference. I'm certainly looking forward to finishing up my application um, and seeing everyone else's, uh, what everyone else has to present. Uh, last year's was certainly really uh, a lot of really uh, interesting talks. And I also want to thank Josh and Timur for hosting this, you know, like having this kind of community is, is just, uh, you know, really, really amazing. So appreciate all the work you guys do. Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so yeah, you. yeah, totally. Um, so yes, I'm the uh, chief technology officer at a company called Output. We make um, music plugins for um, your DAW, um, such as Arcade, which is sort of like a sample playground. Uh, portal is kind of a granular effect. Thermal is sort of more of like a kind of multi-band distortion type effect. These are all really cool, really fun, um, and um, it's okay. I, I will also mention that you know we're always looking to hire cool software engineers if that sounds like it's up your alley. Um, and um, you know it, we have a lot of really interesting challenges in the world of audio development, and um, hopefully I'll get to talk about some of these at some point. My talk today is going to be about something that's totally different. Um, which is my PhD thesis. Uh, I graduated from uh, my PhD program about three years ago. And um, the project that I worked on was basically something called um, Oroglyph, which is what's being called a modular music sketchpad. Um, and maybe to just kind of kick things off, I can go ahead and share my screen and um, we will see um, the presentation. Cool. So Oroglyph is a modular music sketchpad. What does that even mean? Um, sometimes I wonder that myself. Um, maybe after this talk, you will know, and maybe I will know as well. So um, basically, my backgrounds especially are in kind of two major areas um, besides audio programming, specifically related to mobile devices, as well as music programming. Um, so uh, when I was an undergrad, I started working with a programming language called Chuck. And, um, built like a lot of the sort of core technology within Chuck. Um, if you ever used it before, um, it's, it's a pretty fun one. I recommend checking it out. Um, it's been used for things like live coding in some cases. It's kind of like in, in, the, in the heat with things like super collider and tidal cycles. Um, as well, I worked for a mobile um, music company earlier in my career, basically making iPhone apps for music. Um, including one called Ocarina, where basically you would blow into your phone and play it like, like a flute. Um, and we also made like a auto-tune app for, for T-Pain. So kind of like two different aesthetics there, but um, both really important parts of my, uh, my personal background. So what, um, did I skip something? Okay. So what about programming? Let me go, let me just like, that's a actually kind of, a key point in the presentation. So let me set that up a little bit. There are like a ton of cool apps for music making and probably people um, who are listening right now, you know, you've, you've either made these or used these. Um, I love all the stuff that AudioKit is doing. Moog has like some amazing um, music uh, music apps that they've released. Um, there's too, too many to, to name really. And it's it's really exciting to see basically mobile, uh, mobile music and, and music apps for your phone or iPad or whatever really exploding. Um, but the question I kind of came to was like, what about programming? Um, I, one day I was basically just sitting with an iPad, messing around, making a bunch of cool, cool music and stuff. And um, I was like, the only thing I can't really do with this is program. Um, so how do we, how do we kind of like solve that problem? Is there like any, is it crazy to think that you might be able to program with an iPad? Um, and kind of more to the point, you know, can we even, empower creative coding using mobile touch technology? Can we not just have like, yeah, I guess you can program with this, but like, yes, I totally want to program with this. This is amazing. Like I love programming with this. Um, basically, can we, um, can we make a system for creative programming that's in some way better using an iPad or a phone 
um, and really use the capabilities of the touch screen um, to somehow make coding better. And if you think about it, it's a little bit crazy because when you think about how you work as a coder, you're constantly typing. So without a keyboard and without like an actual physical keyboard, um, you're kind of, you're kind of, there's not that much you can do, I guess. And it, it can be sort of limiting. So this was sort of a crazy idea. Um, fortunately, I was trying to get a PhD thesis and they, they love crazy ideas in the academic world. So um, I went with this. Um, a little bit of background. I touched on this already, but um, the kind of two areas of my background that have informed this are what you see um, on this side. This is Chuck. This is what a typical Chuck program looks like. Um, I've been working with Chuck for, for forever and been part of the core team, basically working on this music programming language. So, you know, I like to think I know a thing or two about music programming. Um, as well, kind of mobile touch technology on the other side here, this is um, one of the modes of Ocarina where you can see, you can't really hear it right now, but you can see people playing. Um, this is someone, uh, looks like in Sweden somewhere, uh, basically playing their phone and we can, you know, you would be able to hear this in theory. For now, we can just see it. Um, so this was like a mobile phone app I worked on. Uh, really, like in the first, with this came out like the first year that mobile phone apps were were a thing for for iOS at least. Um, and that's not to say there aren't systems where you can basically do programming on your um, on your iPhone or your your iPod. Like Codia is like has been around forever. Um, it's popular for making games and they've since released something called, um, I think it's called Shade, which is actually like very similar to what I'm about to show, which is really cool. Um, Swift Playgrounds has been kind of more aimed at um, education and kind of people who are pretty pretty new and, and, and kids really. Uh, Touch Develop is actually a really interesting project for Microsoft Research where they kind of like started out with similar goals. Scratch as well is kind of a little bit but more, uh, again, oriented towards kind of younger people. Um, but again, like this, this is programming. You can do this on a touch screen. Uh, the React table, of course, is, is something that I think is really influential in terms of like um, the work that has gone into Orglyph. But I guess you could sort of ask like, is the React table considered programming? That's a question maybe for the audience or at least to um, maybe provoke some discussion. Um, so, to start things off, I was like, okay, well, I know what Chuck is, and like I, I know how to you know use Chuck to do things. So let me just make this on the iPad. So this was something I made, kind of like sort of half expecting it to, to not be that successful. And um, I don't you know really use this too much, and, and this has never been released. Um, it's open source, so you can go download it right now from my GitHub if you want. But um, you know, I was like, let's see how bad this is to actually type code on an iPad. Um, and, you know, I wouldn't say it was great, but um, it did it did exist. And um, maybe it partly proved my point that like typing isn't really the answer here. So then I thought about um, this, you know, this was all like kind of starting around 2013. The machine learning renaissance was back in full swing. There's so many libraries you can download for gesture recognition, especially for handwriting recognition. The post office has been in handwriting recognition on, you know, your your mail for decades at this point. So you can just go download like ten different handwriting recognition libraries um, and put them in your code right now. So I kind of put two and two together and was like, what if instead of typing code, you can actually draw your code or write your code, like with text? Um, and so I kind of ran with that a little bit. So let's take another step back. Um, this idea of sketching code, I think, you know, was, was pretty intriguing to me. And the idea of sketching in general, I think, is actually really interesting from a musical perspective. Um, we can go way back, but just taking it to, um, you know, in the 1950s, there was a Canadian animator named Norm McLaren who produced an Oscar-winning film called Neighbors. Um, it won for, I think, best um, international short film where he basically painted little um, blobs on the soundtrack portion of film to produce the soundtrack. So this is kind of one of the first cases of someone actually like drawing something that's then kind of transduced into sound using some kind of um, uh, electronic uh, medium. Daphne Oram, another very like well-known example. Um, she was working with the uh, Radiophonic Sound Laboratory 
um, and basically she had this crazy setup. There's an app that you can download actually that um, my friend Prague helped make um, really cool app that basically kind of simulates a lot of this. Um, Ivan Sutherland had, a, this was not really music related, but um, he kind of like explored this territory a lot as well, basically drawing different things into kind of like a touch screen and being able to manipulate it. Um, here's Ivan Sutherland basically drawing waveforms. That's Max Matthews, who many consider to be the father of computer music. Um, they were kind of plotting different things and, uh, and listening to what it sounded like um, way back in the 1960s. Yanis Zanakis had a really interesting system called the UPIC or UPIC. I forget what it stands for. Um, but basically, this was pretty cool because you could actually, um, on, the, on this panel you see here, you could draw two different things. You could draw the low level waveforms. So you would draw like what the actual waveform looked like that would be cycling over and over. And then you could also draw basically how these waveforms would be um, mapped to frequency over time. So it was kind of like both the micro, the microscopic level, as well as kind of the macroscopic kind of compositional level. Um, really interesting device. Actually, a book just came out about it, like a retrospective on, uh, as far as like, not just the device itself, but the impact that it's had on um, the musical community. Um, this is Herbie Hancock and the Fairlight CMI. Um, the CMI actually allowed you to draw in waveforms and play them back. It was probably one of the one of the earlier uh, wavetable synthesizers, and, and you could actually draw, draw wavetables. I don't know if Herbie Hancock used this a lot, um, but it is sort of similar to this idea of like draw, being able to draw sound. This is Kate Bush, also a well-known Fairlight CMI user. Um, and just more generally, I think like the idea of sketching is really interesting as far as like um, any sort of creative process. Uh, whether it's purely kind of more in the aesthetic realm, like music or, or drawing or painting or, or, you know, creative writing, or if it's something like, you know, let's say you have a really hard technical problem you're trying to solve, like at your programming job, you know, what do you do? You go, you whiteboard it and you draw different ideas and you kind of like erase some things and maybe draw something else and like try a few different ideas out. Um, sketching in general kind of allows you to, um, um, really just explore lots of different ideas in a very sort of natural way where you're kind of in between both imagining the idea, sort of seeing it as you're drawing it and then being able to like kind of like iterate on that. Um, so this is a drawing I, I borrowed from uh, Bilver Plank, who's like a very um, well-known UX designer or UX sort of theorist. I definitely recommend his writings if you're interested in any of this stuff. So I kind of put all these ideas together into something called Orglyph. And so, um, now I will do a little bit of a demonstration. So this is what um, it looks like if you watch a video that I made of it, but I can do a live demonstration instead. So let me make sure this will work. I have an iPad connected here and um, let's see. Everyone see that? Yep. Yep, uh, we, we yep. can see it. Now we can see it. Great, cool. So this is Orglyph. This is sort of what you start out with. It's basically just a blank canvas with just this little icon in the middle that represents a speaker. Are you like pinching? Um, yeah, so this is a pinch gesture. Um, you can zoom in and out and kind of move around and see things. Um, if you draw, I have a stylus here. So um, if you just draw things, Normally, um, you kind of uh, get, you know, you just, it's just drawing basically, you know, you can kind of draw whatever you want. But um, if you kind of switch to this other mode, you can draw things that get recognized. So this basically got recognized as like an audio node. So if you're familiar with kind of the lower level details of audio um, programming and, and synthesis, you know, this is basically just kind of one block in your, your audio graph or your audio chain. Um, or one module, I guess, in your modular synthesizer. Um, there's a whole bunch of different options. There's these sort of abstract symbols and there's, there's somewhere else there's a reference for these so you can kind of understand what they all mean. But um, I think we can probably guess what uh, this one here means. This is a sine wave. I'm gonna go ahead and uh, play this kind of quietly and then ramp it up just to make sure I don't uh, hurt anyone's hearing. All right, good old sine wave. Um, 
you know, gotta love them. In theory, that's all we really need, and that's all I'm gonna start off with um, to start here. But um, let's go ahead and take another sine wave, and you can basically map kind of anything to anything. There's a lot of modulation possibilities here. So now I'm doing basically AM, amplitude modulation. Okay, um, AM is cool. Let's get some FM in there too. Um, I love me some FM. And let's crank the gain on this. I'm going to crank this up to like a thousand, let's say. Going. Of course, we have um, oops. we have a grab bag of filters, so you can see these um, high pass, low pass, band pass. Uh, there's a few others, but let's try the uh, low pass first. So uh, it got a lot quieter, but we can go ahead and. Um, Sounds like a low pass to me. Um, always a crowd pleaser to just sweep the filter a little bit. Um, and then uh, let's change it up a little bit. So what else should we put in here? Um, we can put this through an envelope and maybe get a little bit more of a rhythmic kind of variety. Um, so now we're not going to hear anything. This is your typical ADSR envelope. Um, nothing too surprising. We do have to trigger it somehow. And um, the way I'm going to do that is with a different type of node. So if you draw a square, you get this different menu of um, different types of control rate nodes. So um, this kind of blocky looking thing, this is a sequencer. And you can basically add um, as many steps as you think you need. I'm going to just kind of play it straight with eight steps here to start with. And then uh, let's go ahead and trigger this. Cool. Um, so I'm not getting a lot of variety here, but one thing I'm going to do is um, throw some delays in. I always love delays. If we make these a little bit separated, get maybe just a tiny bit of spatialization. And then um, another thing I can do, again, we're not getting a ton of variation here, but what I can start to do is basically use um, blocks of control nodes to get, uh, to build up different, um, to build a scale basically. So. I can use this basically to map the output of the sequencer to um, different scale degrees. So I'm gonna go and take this and pop this into the degree here. And then the second thing I'm gonna do is, um, I don't really have a great icon for it, but this this one right here, this arrow, is a, um, a MIDI to frequency converter. So um, let's go ahead and map some frequencies here. All right, so we got, we got some, some tonality now. That's kind of cool. Uh, uh, the other thing I can do, I can make this major, minor, whatever. Um, put all my music theory um, education to work here.
And let's make this a little bit brighter. Let's just make this like 10,000. All right, yeah, it's pretty pretty delicate right now. If I wanna save this, um, I can go ahead and save it and I can draw something to remember my sketch by. So I'm just gonna call this um, app meetup. Um, and then I can continue to draw different things and like, you know, annotate this and kind of do what I want really. Um, and to give you an idea of kind of how you might um, use this in practice, I, so I've actually kind of gone on, I'll talk about this a little bit. I've actually kind of performed with this as a performing instrument. And, um, you know, this is one of, this is the bass patch for one of the songs that I have. I read the fader a little bit, so I don't So this is something that I've kind of played around, uh, you know, different performance and DIY spaces in Los Angeles where I live uh, most of the time. And basically, it's just a simple FM patch with um, a lot of delays um, and some all-pass filters. So I've kind of made like sort of a really basic mini reverb. You can see with the all-pass filters here and the cascade of delays. This bit is kind of a fun one. This is basically just um, a multiplier. So I'm multiplying the output of the delays together, which doesn't do that much normally if you're just multiplying silence or like a low level by a low level. But it does kind of make things go crazy once it's like the, um, the actual sound going through it is a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more going on. So one thing I can do here is um, I can control both the scale as well as um, basically the amount of the scale that I'm accessing. So we can see a sequence that I've made here. And as I multiply the output of that sequence, it basically kind of activates a broader range of the scale. And then what I've also set up is basically a, an FM patch where I can control the index of modulation, the gain here. We start to hear these brighter tones. Um, the other thing I've set up is um, all of this area over here that's very tonal is going through um, basically a gain control. I have this as set up as a gain control. And then it's connected to the phase of the sine waves. So this is basically a, a phase distortion. So as I increase our wave shaping, as I increase the gain here, Clipping a little bit for me, so I apologize for that. Um, even like add to it and get a lot of like kind of wackiness and um, very non-linear, that's for sure. Um, so it's fun. libraries to, to turn in there to kind of take that for um, you know maybe a few minutes um, so anyways um, that's Orglyph a brief demo of kind of all the different things you can do with it and then um, the other bit this was all part of a research project and in the research world um, you know there are uh, basically, you kind of have an idea and then you set up, um, you know, an evaluation and you want to know, like, you know, is the thing you said, like, true or not? And to what degree is it true? And so what I was basically trying to say is that this is actually cool and usable for music performance. And so to prove this, I basically was like, all right, I'm just going to play some shows. And if I don't get tomatoes thrown at me, um, you know, maybe this is a successful kind of musical instrument of sorts or meta instrument, or at least like a platform for, for, for music creation. Um, so I set up a solo practice. Um, I've, I've been playing shows. Uh, I haven't actually done any shows since kind of everything closed down here, but, um, but, but, but it, was, it was all good fun. I haven't got tomatoes thrown at me yet. 
um, it's, it's been really fun to actually kind of like have a totally, like a totally different um, type of musical experience to, to show to people. And usually when I do perform, I kind of project what I'm doing, like, I, like I'm showing you now um, so that, you know, there is like this sort of like visual element that people can, can see and respond to. Um, so this is one of the pieces, oops, is there a way to turn this down? Um, so yeah, this is one of the earlier pieces I made. And what I love is just kind of seeing all these waveforms like go all around the place. Um, by the time this piece is over, like basically the entire screen is just full of like these waveforms that like are just too big to be represented. Um, this is another fun one. I actually meant to show this during the demo, but uh, there's a module where you can basically just draw the waveform itself. So this is a pretty direct connection to the sound itself, I, I would say, and definitely invokes sort of the ideas I was talking about earlier with, um, you know, having some sort of connection to the sound itself, as well as um, some of the interfaces like the UPIC or um, uh, some of the other sort of graphic uh, uh, compositional tools. Um, this is a show I played. We don't need to see that. Um, I hosted a bunch of workshops at the time I was teaching at a school called California Institute of the Arts, um, somewhat close to Los Angeles. Um, and so I taught students this and, you know, I started showing it to students and they became really interested in it and I kind of like use this as a teaching platform, which, which was pretty cool. Um, so this is kind of a jam sesh that some of the students were having, uh, which is pretty fun. Sorry, are you showing stuff on your screen? Because I'm not sure people are seeing this. We're, they're seeing our faces. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, thanks. Thanks for mentioning that. Um, let me go ahead and share my screen and uh, try this over. Um, cool. Let me go back to, okay. So I was saying solo practice. Can you see sense, my screen now? Yes. <laughs> cool. Um, thank you for pointing that out. Um, so yeah, this is uh, again. Sorry, this is so loud. Um, not really. um, anyways, these are a few of the pieces that um, kind of resulted from that. So yeah, here you can see basically drawing drawing the forms and having a sort of projection. This one sounds great on like an amazing, like a sound with amazing bass, like um, subwoofer or something, like really, really fun to hear this like through a massive PA. A little different over like, you know, my tiny little headphones. Um, so yeah, this is sort of the result of some of the workshops. Um, I had a bunch of concerts with uh, students that I was teaching at the time. Uh, this is a piece we did with audience participation. So later on, um, actually, the people in the audience have iPads too, and they all the iPads have Oroglyph. And so there's a way you can actually rent iPads, I guess, for like corporate events and things like that, where you just need a bunch of iPads. You could rent them for a weekend. And so that's what we did. And um, we loaded them all up with, with Oroglyph um, and kind of tried to see what would happen if, you know, all of these sort of people at this uh, this musical event were uh, presented with, with this interface. Um, so here's where everyone joins in. Um, you know, I wouldn't say this is the greatest musical result, but it was, it was certainly interesting to see what would happen. Um, so yeah, in conclusion, you know, I think it's been really fun getting here. Um, I have a few thoughts on the technology as well. Um, since this is kind of more of a programmer oriented um, environment, you know, I can share some thoughts on kind of the um, programming part of it. Um, you know, basically this is entirely programmed mostly from scratch. Um, I used a machine learning library for the handwriting recognition. Um, like I said, there's a bunch of these you can get and um, you know, I can, I can give out links later on if, if anyone's interested. Um, all of the graphics I made in OpenGL, the sound engine is basically something I made myself as well. Um, 
basically from scratch, just using kind of the the, the basic uh, you know processing callback from um, from iOS. I don't necessarily know if I would recommend that approach, but one of the things that um, this did really help out with is you know for things like drawing. Um, you know, you can get like hundreds of waveforms and be able to draw all of those dynamically. And I think that's a really important part of, of this and a really important part of like the kind of sonic exploration that I want to enable um, is that, you know, you can see basically what each wave or what each um, processing node is doing to the resulting audio. And so like every step of the way you have this visual indicator of like, oh, okay, that's, that's crazy. That's what FM looks like. You can see the wave basically compressing and, and, and expanding. Um, so it's pretty cool to have that. And I don't know if that would be possible without basically the approach I use, which is like, I have a shader where I just pass in a raw audio buffer and it just basically spits out the pixels needed to, to draw that audio buffer. Um, I think it would be a lot harder to draw, to, to do kind of the level of, of graphics that I wanted for this without basically going totally from scratch. Problem is it takes a lot longer, you know, this project has been going on for a while and um, it's just harder to, to work with these tools. So it's, it's always a trade off of like, do you build the thing and get like the absolute maximum performance, which was certainly my mindset at the time, you know, I don't know if I would make that same decision now, but um, the alternative is, do you use all this stuff that you get for free from a library, from a framework, and then, um, you know, maybe do you run into limits at, at a certain point, depending on what it is you wanna do. Um, so skipping back ahead, um, that's more or less most of what I had to talk about uh, or what I had prepared today, but um, definitely if you're interested, um, head to our website, feel free to sign up for the mailing list or follow um, uh, the social media accounts I have either for Orglyph or my own personal account. Um, feel free to get in touch um, as well if you're interested about any of the work that I've done with output and um, thank you for for having me. Um, yeah, thanks, Spencer. I think we have um, we have a bunch of questions, don't we, Josh? Yeah, loads. Uh, so one question is, can you can you folder uh, a project within uh, have have a pod within a pod? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I, I built that it wasn't very stable, but that's sort of the idea is like, you would be able to kind of cascade these things. And um, also use that as like something for polyphony, there isn't really a great polyphony story, there is MIDI input. So like, if you plug in a keyboard to this, um, you can, um, you know, you can get that information and map that to sound however you like. But imagine if you could like, basically take an entire patch, circle it up, and then like copy it like eight times and you have like a instant synthesizer. Yeah, great. Um, expensive brother asked a question. Can you talk a little bit about the approach of representing patch chords in code? Yeah, it's, you know, it's a tricky problem um, in, in some ways, but um, there, you know, I, I did spend a lot of time with it. And the patch chords themselves, um, they display an audio waveform. That's kind of like probably one of the trickiest parts of it. Um, one of the things I did do, I mentioned this, basically I wrote a custom OpenGL shader um, that draws the waveform given just a straight audio buffer. So you don't have to copy anything. You just take the audio buffer that you're passing between the two nodes that already exists you give it to a shader, the shader does the rest of the work. So it's very low cost to actually draw um, the patch chords and, and all the, um, the additional data. The other thing I'm doing there is I'm scaling them in a weird way. So what I'm doing is I'm basically estimating the gain of each patch chord or of each waveform and doing, uh, I'm basically normalizing it to kind of like a, a gain of one and then I rescale it according to the estimated gain, but logarithmically. So that way, basically, as your sound gets louder and louder, the visual representation doesn't occupy the entire screen. It actually makes like a better sort of like visualization because it also maps to the way that we hear sound. If you double the amplitude of a wave, it doesn't sound twice as loud. It sounds, you know, somewhat less than twice as loud. Um, so I wanted to have a way to basically visually represent that as well. 
Um, and then lastly, the, the connections between the control nodes are kind of totally different and they're kind of more at a control rate basis. And like there's some fun, there's a fun bag of tricks that I had to use to, to get that all to kind of look cool, but um, uh, similar, similar sorts of ideas. Um, I do actually have a question myself as well. Uh, I'm really kind of curious about this whole graph stuff. It's like, um, so um, first of all, like presumably underlying this this graph, you, you have some kind of data structure for that that you've written yourself, right? Mm -hmm. so, so there's kind of two ways of doing a graph like this. Um, as far as I know, you can do like uh, kind of top, like push or pull, right? So you can say, okay, so these are like the starting nodes and then we have cables going to these other nodes and you're gonna just kind of so do it like a topological sort and treat that as a bag and like go from input to output. Or you can do like the other way around. You can start by this is what I'm outputting and you know, where is, what is feeding into this and what is feeding into this and kind of go, go, go up instead. Uh, so which, which one of these are you using and why? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, this is this is just a poll. It's a poll architecture. So basically, you start at the output, and then you just kind of like go back, um, and every node keeps asking the nodes behind it for samples until basically everyone's um, processed the samples that they need to. Um, I chose that direction mainly because that was what I was initially because that was what I was most familiar with. Um, that's what Chuck uses. Um, I will say that it's not the most efficient. Um, and I think that's okay for this. It actually like efficiency has not been a problem. You know, like I was originally developing this on like a 2012 era iPad and getting, being able to get hundreds of nodes up and running. And so, you know, I, I think like you could make it more efficient by a, a bunch of different approaches, but basically pulling from nodes and like all those cache misses, like it, it's it's not great for audio, but it's been fine. And I think like, that's always gonna be my perspective on performance optimization is like, when you start to hear clicks and stuff, like finding that you don't see that are a problem. Yeah, I think that's really great advice as a kind of a general strategy. I can definitely, definitely get behind that. Thanks for explaining that. Right. For sure. So, there were a couple questions just around the future plans for this. Any plans to render it in 3D? Any plans for an iPhone release? Or is this exclusive to iPad? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, or those are, those are great, great questions. Um, I started to toy with the idea of doing like a version because, you know, it's easy to think about this and then, you know, you see something like, um, uh, you know, like a lot of the kind of cool VR apps that are similar to this and like be like, let's let's go do it that way too. Um, I think what I do like about this is it is a little bit more accessible. And I think like, you know, I, I approach these as sort of research problems where you sort of have to understand kind of the medium before you get really like, you know, really deep into it. So, you know, I would want to, I wouldn't want to, you know, really kind of have a half-hearted effort into as far as like VR. Um, but I can totally see that direction. And I think that also um, enables like a lot of other features with like collaboration and stuff like that. Um, mm -hmm. And as well as engaging space a little bit more. Um, for the phone version, yeah, I think, th I think that's likely, you know, um, it is a little bit different just because it's, it's just a smaller screen and it's a little bit harder to work with and, and it, it does make a difference. Right. And you said all the graphics are done in OpenGL. Uh, so there were a couple questions as well about architecture. Uh, so graphics were done in OpenGL. Uh, the processing is an engine is all done in raw C++. Is that right? Or was it done in Swift? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, raw C++. Yeah, it's, it's C++ all the way, uh, yeah. which presents its own challenges. Um, you know, it, it is very, it is very much like an object oriented architecture. Um, and basically the, the, the rough idea is that every node kind of has um, a couple of different representations, um, which, which is its own kind of like complexity, but basically there's kind of the audio representation. What does it sound like? As well as the graphical representation. What does it look like? How does it draw itself? <clears throat> And in some ways, these are related because um, I didn't really show this too much, but like a lot of the nodes, they actually they appear differently depending on how you've configured them. And you know, I think that as well is like an interesting direction to go in. Like, 
you know, as you change your envelope, like you should see that envelope, um, you know, look like the way it actually sounds, and maybe even have some feedback as far as to like what part of the envelope it's in. Mm -hmm. um, and then, um, you know, with the graphic system, it's similar to the audio system, you know, it's like kind of like a, like an object kind of entity based model. So basically, everything that's drawn on screen has a class and a class instance associated with it. So nodes are their own kind of class, uh, connections are their own kind of class, uh, the patch cables, all the UI, you know, that's its own kind of class that renders itself. Um, so that's kind of the, the basic model. And, and it's the same, same general concept. Basically, you have a list of objects, you just iterate through them all and draw them or render them um, until everything that has rendered has, has, has done its thing. Great, thank you. Uh, another question, can you, can you create feedback loops? And if so, how does that work with the pool architecture? Yeah, yeah, um, you can create feedback loops. It's not super optimized right now. So with the pool architecture, basically, if there isn't a delay in your feedback loop, it'll have an implicit delay of um, your buffer size. So what I'd like to basically eventually Tackle is um, like a loop detection. It's it's not necessarily an easy problem, especially if you get into like crazy loops that people might want to do. Um, but I would love to have like a better solution for that because there are so many cool ideas that you can get from like having feedback, like building your own comb filters and putting like um, you know other kinds of filters like within the feedback loop of of like whatever sort of feedback system you're making, as well as whatever crazy ideas like. I haven't thought of yet that that maybe someone else out there has. Okay, great. Uh, here's a question. Um, they think it might be a little bit too generalized, but can visual and graph based programming ever be accessible? Uh, question. Um, yeah, I don't, I'm not sure if I understand that maybe, one. Maybe for someone who's visually impaired, for example, that mm. some, maybe that's what they mean. Yeah. Yeah, yeah that, that's, a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, I think it is a challenge. Um, one of the directions I kind of got in, you know, I think a lot of this was kind of motivated by accessibility and not necessarily to, um, to people who might be vision impaired, but more to people who don't have computers, but do have a mobile phone of some kind. Um, I think we're finding more and more, like this is like how people, you know, experience computers is through a phone or an iPad or something else basically. And like, I, this is just gonna, this trend will, I think only continue. So I think if you don't really have tools for this, this sort of level of creation, you know, like if I didn't have a computer growing up, I never, I wouldn't be talking here now, you know, like, and if I didn't know how to program, if I didn't learn how to program that computer and like have access to like these kind of more like off the rails sorts of, uh, you know, computing experiences. And so I think that's ultimately what I, what I want to give to people is like something that like kind of inspires them. Um, but as far as like kind of vision impairedness, one thing I did think of, or one thing actually React Table does is it has actual physical tokens. And so if you combine that with maybe like a haptic interface, you could probably actually make something pretty, pretty interesting. Okay, great. Just getting a question from, from my son, actually. He's, oh, cool. he's asked this question. I'm just trying to understand him. Uh, so, so I think he's, I think what he's asking is, uh, will there, will there ever be an option to be able to do, um, like procedural, uh, code in our glyph. So be able to do any sort of, uh, scripting or anything like that. Yeah. I've thought a lot about that. Um, and even like thinking about how would you, you know, there's, there's a lot of scripting languages you can embed these days into, you know, pretty much any application you're making. And what I really want to figure out is like, how do you kind of go both ways? Because I think a lot of these environments, um, you know, like Max MSP, for instance, there's like a, there's an object where you just, you can write some JavaScript code in it. But I also want to like, say like, if you, let's say you're coding, like, how do you have like an entire org lift program and like assign that to a variable or something? And like, this is your graph. And then like, you can manipulate that pr procedurally. So basically have this sort of like, bi-directional interaction between 
what you're doing that's node and graph based and what you're doing that's procedural based. Nice. Great. I think, I think we got all of them.